day study is in Matthew chapter 18. Um, just start out in verse 1. Uh, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know, it's funny, but you see the competition uh, even in the early church. <laughs> you had the disciples all trying to outdo each other. You know, you find this in, in the church at Corinth. You find at least among the the uh, church people in Corinth, you know, one saying that they're on Apollo's side and the other saying they're on Paul's side and the other saying they were on Peter's side and, and you know, all this kind of, you know, kind of competition that was there. Um, and, and I'm not saying competition is always wrong. I think that uh, poly- competition can be, can be healthy to a point. Um, but you notice here, they're asking, you know, who's going to be the greatest, you know, out of, out of the disciples, you know. And, um, you know, Jesus kind of turns things around on them a little bit. And, and you know, we see this today in church culture today. You know, churches in competition with each other. Uh, I've been in churches where there were more than, you know, several guys that were called to preach. And you end up with uh, these uh, younger preachers, or, and even sometimes older ones, uh, in competition over who's, who's going to be the better preacher, who's going to have the better, bigger ministry, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, we see this a lot in America. You know, churches constantly popping up, uh, and that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes God leads in that. Sometimes I think people, you know, don't work their problems out, so they go somewhere else or they start something else. And 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 you know, you got everybody wanting to be chiefs, uh, very few wanting to to be the Indians and, and follow leadership. So you, know, you have various reasons, and yet I know God works in spite of our problems god works you know he blesses and he saves souls and you know and 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 so but here we find uh the the even in the early church and in and in the disciples and the close-knit group of guys who walked with jesus uh they want to know who is the greatest among us who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and jesus called and you know they're all thinking it's going to be them uh <laughs> or at least one of them and Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. Now, you know, these guys are thinking, what? What's he doing? You know, what he, is he going to make, you know, what's he going to say here? Um, surely this little child is not the the greatest among us all. You know, is, is this young man going to be, you know, is he fixing to tell us something about this young man, that this young man's going to grow up and be the next Billy Graham? Is he, <laughs> you know, is he going to be, you know, what's he going to say here? Uh he calls this young child to him, and you notice that the young child, you know, that children were comfortable around Jesus, you know, and, um, you know, I've been around some pastors who I was uncomfortable around, you know, they seemed to put off a sense, I remember one time, you know, a meeting uh, a, a, a preacher who I had really looked up to, you know, and heard preach, and, uh, and uh, you know, just really wanted to meet him, and he wasn't like a celebrity preacher as far as that goes you know i mean he was in arkansas he was but he was one of the better known at a larger church and i remember being at a conference and you know i was a new new pastor and and i remember trying you know kind of wanting to walk up and talk to him and and just there was this air of intimidation that was there um and then when i did finally go up and talk to him he he honestly had no time for me um and uh, maybe he was busy. Maybe he was just having a bad day. I'm going to show him grace because of that. But I remember that struck me, and I thought, how, why am I so intimidated here to, to walk up, you know, to people? And I think that's something that's, you know, we need to try to be as Christians is to be a people, especially if you're in leadership, to be someone who's approachable, someone who both the uh, scholar and the, the young new convert would feel comfortable coming up to and, and talking to. You know, some intimidation is not on the part of the person we approach. I, I, probably this guy that I'm talking about, I met, probably the biggest part of it wasn't something he did. It was probably in me that I was just in, in, afraid of rejection or afraid he would, you know, and it was probably partially on my part there. But what we notice here is Jesus is so approachable. You know, I think about kids going to sit on the lap of Santa and how many of them you see who are scared to death, you know, and they're, you know, they're crying. You see these pictures and (laughs) I guess because sometimes Santa can be intimidating, you know, to these young kids. But Jesus 
uh, is very approachable, and kids felt comfortable being around him. I believe Jesus was uh, was very he wasn't this stoic character that some of our movies have portrayed him as. You know, I've, I think of especially some of the Hollywood movies of the '60s, the '70s. Um, and Jesus is, uh, there's one I believe called Jesus of Nazareth where Jesus is always real stoic. He's real intimidating. He's real somber all the time. You never see him smile or, or show any joy. Uh, and uh, I love the new the new movie uh, Chosen. I think I think that's a wonderful portrayal of Jesus. There's also a, a series if you've never seen it called Matthew, and it actually goes through uh, the entire book of Matthew, and it tells all the stories. It actually would be good to do as we study this. Um, if you could find that, I don't know if it's I know it's on DVD. You know I know it's out there. I think I may have a copy of that. I know I had a VHS copy of it years ago, but that's probably long gone. And it wouldn't have anything to play it on <laughs> anyway. But uh, that story, Matthew, so good, so good, so powerful. And the presentation of Jesus there was a man who was serious, but yet a man who also knew how to laugh and was very approachable. And somebody that you know, even children wanted to come and be around. And so we find here that uh, he calls a little child. The child comes and he says, Really, I say unto you, except you be converted, and become his little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He said, listen, this is not about you, um, you know, uh, becoming some great spiritual leader. You know, I think sometimes, you know, we see people who we admire spiritually, whether it's a pastor or a theologian or, you know, there are people I've heard over the years who say, I'd like to be the next Billy Graham. I'd like to be the next... I've heard people say, you know, I look at Mother Teresa and I would like to, you know, her theology was obviously off, you know, in Catholicism. But, you know, that doesn't mean she wasn't a believer. That means she wasn't saved. And she definitely reached out and, and helped so many people. But, you know, we kind of lift these folks up probably a lot higher than what they would lift themselves up. You know, if you actually got to know them, they would probably tell you. I don't know how I got here, you know, other than by the grace of God, and I know I don't deserve this, and I know that, you know, it's not about me, it's about Jesus, and, uh, you know, that's that's what you find with so many of those people who we we look to, and we think, ah, if I could just get to that point, I will have arrived, and I will be super spiritual now, and I won't fall into some of the traps I do now, and I'll, never, I will, I'll wake up every day just on fire, and I won't have to struggle with the, you know, what? guess what, guys, those folks struggle too, those folks you know, need the grace of God every day too. They're always reliant on His grace that is sufficient for all of us. You know, if the great apostle Paul was constantly battling and uh, fighting his flesh and having to die daily, you know, uh, then then these folks that we look at of today's time or the last hundred years or two hundred years, um, you know, they struggle too. And that means you're going to go through some battles. That means you're not going to get to a point where you just arrive. You know, and you don't, you know, I, I remember somebody telling me years ago that he believed he would reach a place where he would never sin again, you know, and I thought, and in fact, he told me he had reached that place, actually, and I said, listen, <laughs> number one, you're full of pride <laughs> because you're sitting here boasting about how you don't sin anymore. Uh, number two, you're lying because... <laughs> Uh, I guarantee you, you do. Uh, and the Bible says that if you know to do good and you do it not, then that's sin to you too. So, you know, we all, well, we do strive to be better Christians. So let's not get prideful and somehow think, you know, oh boy, look at me, I've arrived. Everybody look at me as, as, as that I'm above all you. And I don't, and this guy said, I don't sin anymore. You know, you know, give me a break. You know, we know that's not true. So, uh, he brings this little child, and you know, I was reading in one of the commentaries and uh, or listening to a sermon by John Corson. And John Corson uh, said, you know, we need to be childlike at least in three ways. And I thought this was good. I'm going to share it with you guys. He said we need to be uh, uh, childlike in our sincerity. You know, we need to be sincere in what we do. You know, kids, when they tell you something, they're honest. They're true. You know, they're sincere. If a, if a child tells you they love you, then they love you. If they tell you you um, look fat in that... <laughs> A dress or in those pants or whatever you know they're they're just being sincere they're being honest and we should be sincere in our walk with god in that way um uh, he said we should be childlike in our sensitivity you know kids can be sensitive to things and you know sometimes as we get older we can start to you know um put some walls up and we don't 
cry like we what like we you know we're just not as sensitive as we used to be especially to the spirit we can kind of get used to coming to church and and you know and we need to we need to try to maintain that just um sensitivity to the lord and to and be i remember a guy years ago uh named uh, jim and he used to sing specials at the church i grew up in and and probably 90 percent of the time he when he was singing special he would he wouldn't make it through without breaking out in tears and and crying. I remember that always touched me. He was a wonderful singer, but what blessed me more than his voice was that anytime he sang, the 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 sense his sensitivity and his love for Jesus just flowed through the point where he could hardly make it through the song for for you know praying or for uh, breaking down and crying um, uh, and thanking God you know for what God had done for him. And that always blessed me so much. Uh, and then the last thing uh, John Corson talked about uh, is uh, is that we need to be childlike in our simplicity. You know, sometimes we make things real complicated. Kids, kids, kids see things real simply. You know, they don't complicate things as much as what we do a lot of times. And we just need to. You know, Paul talked about that. You know, we don't want to be removed from the simplicity that's in the gospel. You know, sometimes people make it complicated and add all these things to the gospel and how you're saved and how you stay saved and you know and and you know kids you explain the gospel to them and they can just you know they can just believe it and receive it and um and so and i believe god saves kids okay i believe god will touch kids and save them uh so we need to be childlike you know to to just be loving to be as he said sincere and sensitive and uh, and simple, uh, you know, be to, to to receive the simplicity of the gospel. So he says, you know, uh, you got to be like these kids, or you won't enter into the kingdom. He said, whoever this will shall humble himself. So humility, as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of God. And so he said, listen, you know, it's the you know he said another place. You know, the, the, the last will be first and the first will be last. You know, I think when we get to get stand before God, get to heaven, we'll be surprised at who is, you know, seen as the great heroes of the faith. You know, people we've never heard their name and others who we may have heard their name, but maybe they, you know, they're not seen as that so as much. And so I think we'll be surprised at some of those folks that, you know, have been so faithful in the little things. Um, I, uh, you know, sometimes we think the little things don't matter, but I'm telling you, they do. Uh, he says, but whoso uh, shall offend, uh, or whoso shall receive one's little child, in my name receiveth me. And so, you know, we, we need to be somebody who, and I think this kind of applies in two ways. One, in our love for new converts. You know, if you see somebody just get saved, um, you know, we ought to put special prayer and special effort in helping them in the beginning few weeks and months. And, you know, to kind of get established in the faith and, 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 you know, so that because Satan loves to come along and really attack a new believer and try to discourage them, pull them out of church, cause them to believe people don't care about them. I mean, people do, but, you know, they, they, Satan will work to convince folks that they don't. Um, you know, I think most of the time people just get distracted and have their own stuff going on and they end up maybe not reaching out as much as they should because they've got other things and you know they've got squeaky wheels that are always you know coming out of them that demand their attention and so because of that sometimes we neglect to um to nurture uh, those folks but i think it also deals with you know kids that as kids as young kids come toward us you know we need to receive them and not turn them away and if they've got spiritual questions um whether they're uh, a child or somebody who's just coming to faith we, we are our best to help them to to find the answers uh, through the Word of God to the questions that they have. And so um, he says, you know, receiving them. And when we do that, guess what? We, we're we walking with Christ. You know, we're, it's His working in them and working in us. And so we, we maintain a closer walk with Him through that. Uh, I've grown so much at times in my life by ministering to somebody else, you know, uh, you know, pouring out uh, some things that I have in my life. And then God always replenishes that with even more. And I'm thinking I'm helping this person, but really uh, not just helping them. I'm actually blessed at helping myself because God is, you know, working in me as I work with them. And so, uh, and then he says, but whoso shall offend, so we should receive, but then who shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it would be better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck 
and that he were drowned into the depths of the sea. You know, the Pharisees, you know, they didn't have time for children, you know, or childish things. You know, they were, you know, too religious to deal with these kids or to, uh, they would have been, you know, those interested in God. And, you know, the Bible tells us that they had become a, really a stumbling block for people to come into the kingdom. They kind of block the door for people to really get to know God at this point. You know, and they're supposed to be the people helping people to know God. Instead, they're actually hindering people from knowing God. And so, you know, I think about how people treat kids and turn away kids. Um, you know, we got to be so careful the way we deal with kids and the way we deal with those that, are, that God is working in. That is that are seeking Him to know Him. That we don't just turn them away, you know. Uh, that that we, uh, you know, we bless them and help them. And you know, He's really referring here mostly to, to the Pharisees, who, you know, uh, they didn't have time for for this. And He's like, don't be like them. You know, you you be a people who receive these new believers, receive these children, even because you got to become like one of them in order to to really know Me. Um, he says, "Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must be it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offense cometh." So he says, "You know, because of sin, this you know, God is offended by things." It was funny that uh, we're offended by things in this culture we shouldn't be offended by, and things we should be offended by we're not offended by. You know, I'm gonna tell you something. God is offended by some things. Much of the things that the world is pushing for. Uh, God is an offense to God. God is offended by much that our culture is saying we've got to accept and we've got to push, we've got to promote these things. And yet God looks at them and says, you know, this is offensive to me. You know, God, God, it's an offense. And, it should, and let me say this, what offends God should offend us. The things that God hates, we should hate. And so uh, he says, woe unto the world. Uh, and, uh, and by who uh, the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, halt, or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now, I don't believe Jesus is saying here literally that we should go out and you know, if we're, you know, cut our hands off. I believe what he's saying is those things that we would do with our hands, okay, if they are offensive to God, if they're sin, and, and you know, Get them out of your life. Do whatever it takes to cut that off from you, okay? Whatever it takes. Whatever you got to do to get this out of your hands, okay? And, and he, what he's really saying, he says such, I believe, a, such a uh, <laughs> shocking type statement here is he's trying to get us to see how, how terrible hell is and that you would be better off with no hands and no feet, okay, than to spend eternity in hell. Now that you know that doesn't sound like universalism to me, where everybody gets saved, because that's what you know Rob Bell and there's several quote unquote Christian preachers now that have been teaching that you know everybody goes to heaven at some point. Well, then why does Jesus make a statement like this? I mean, he wouldn't make a statement like this unless hell was a terrible place to go. Okay, so. Um, you know, I'm sorry, it's it's not somewhere you want to spend eternity. And, and also the Jehovah's Witness and then some in even in Christendom now, even in the church, quote unquote, um, are teaching that, well, people go to hell, but they just cease to exist once they get there. Well, you know, the Bible's clear that's not true. We find in the book of Luke, the story of rich man Lazarus, which is not a parable. It's a real story because names were mentioned. The name of Lazarus is mentioned. I've talked about this before. Um so it's not a parable. It's a true story. And it speaks of everlasting. Okay. And he speaks here. And if you just died and then just burned up and ceased to exist, then guess what? It wouldn't have been better for you to live in this life without your hands or feet. Okay. Because you just would fail to exist. No, hell is a real place. It's an eternal place. And it's a place of torment. And we got to realize that, you know, without Christ, that's where folks are going to spend eternity. So we need to examine ourselves, make sure that we're in the faith. But we also got to share the gospel with other people. Because I'm telling you guys, our family, our friends, those we love, if they die without Jesus, they're going to spend eternity in this place called hell, the Bible, the, the place the Bible calls hell. In fact, we next verse, if the eye offend thee, so the things we look at, Pluck it out. Cast it from thee. So there are things that we look at that are, are offensive to God. 
that are hurting us. The Bible tells us the, the eyes are a window to the soul for allowing things to infect uh, and invade our souls because we allow them to come in through our eyesight. Okay, things we watch on television, things that we just watch as we're out about the day, people that we look at too long, things of this nature, um, just things that we watch that we shouldn't, that we know offend God, then listen, we need to cut those things out. You know, he said we'd be better off to not have eyes than to spend uh, eternity in hell. Okay, so this is repentance here is what he's speaking of. Um, it's better for thee to, to enter into life with one eye than to have... <laughs> Two eyes to be cast into hellfire. So he's, he's really speaking to the non-believer to say, you must repent, okay? Get rid of this stuff. The things you're doing with your hands, the things you're doing with your eyes, get them out of your life and repent and believe the gospel so you'll have eternal life. Um, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. You know, sometimes those kids would come around, the disciples would try to run them off. <laughs> and Jesus would be like, no, <laughs> let them come to me. Let these kids come to me. We should be joyful about kids. We hear crying babies in church. We ought to rejoice and thank God for it, you know. Uh, the worst sound is to be in church and not hear any kids, not hear any crying babies, not see any messes created by young ones, okay? We should expect and desire to have to clean up some kid's mess, okay? Uh, because that's life in the church. And I'd much rather be in a, a building where we're having to clean up after kids and, and nurture them and, and, and you know, uh, deal with all the stuff that, that you deal with than to be in a church where it's just a somber place and there's no laughter and there's no mistakes and there's no joy and there's no sounds of kids in the place. You know, we, we would should desire to minister to children, okay? So, uh, he says, take heed that you don't spies them. Uh, he said that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. This is one of the verses, really, that uh, one of the main verses speaks of the fact that we are assigned an angel, that these kids have a guardian angel, if you will. Now, it's not a loved one who died. Uh, you know, people don't die and become angels. You know, I hear people a lot of times say, well, you know, I got my so-and-so uncle died, and now he's my guardian angel. No, he's not. You're, you're, <laughs> he's not. People don't get their wings, okay? This is not, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a wonderful life, okay? You know, people get this kind of idea, you know, uh, the angel got his wings or, you know, and as if it was a, a person who became an angel or something and got their wings. This is terrible theology, okay? But it's something you see, you know. Um, uh, in fact, to me, the angels that we see in the Bible didn't have wings. Some of, you know, the cherubim and seraphim do, but... You know, the, the men that we see um, standing at the tomb, we don't hear any mention of wings and this kind of stuff. So they appeared as men. Oftentimes, they just appeared as men. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, some of these superstitions and things you hear about, you know, we need to be careful of that. But at the same time, uh, the Bible tells us we have a uh, we have an angel that that's, is on our behalf. That's what it says here. The angels do always behold the face of my Father, their angels, which is in heaven. So, you know, be thankful God has an angel looking out for you, he, he, protecting you, battling for you. You know, we need to understand that we're, we're not alone. The Holy Spirit is with us and dwells us. But also, angel, an angel has been assigned to us. And I believe God also dispatches more angels when we are in a time of need. Uh, you know, when Jesus was in the garden, the angels came and they comforted him. You know, they strengthened him. Uh, for the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. You know, Jesus came to save sinners. He didn't come just to come to those who appear to be righteous, which none are righteous, okay? But he didn't come just for the religious crowd, the people who have been in church all their life. Jesus came to save those that were all kinds of, in all kinds of sin, far away from him, and he came to save them. In fact, he says, How thank you if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray? Does he not leave the ninety-nine and goeth into the mountains and seek the one which is gone astray? You know, if we are lost, Jesus comes for us. You know, that tells us something there that, you know, God orchestrates events and things and puts people on our path to bring us to him. You know, he wants to save us and he will, you know, don't neglect those things. You know, if you begin to have thoughts about God or people begin to come to your life that share the gospel with with you um 
you know, think back in your life. The people God sent and the things that he sent, the, the events that took place that begin to open your eyes to who he was. That is God at work in your life. And Jesus, look, he left heaven to come to the earth to die on the cross for sinners like you and, you and I. I mean, he, he's the ultimate representation of this, that to leave the 99 and go for just that one who was be willing to repent. You know, I heard a story a while back of a, a pastor who, uh, you know, he resigned the church because after five years of pastoring there, there was only one convert. One, only one person had come to Christ in five years, and that man uh, resigned because he was so discouraged and, and uh, felt like he had had no impact. And yet that one young man, a child, who got saved, later on became a missionary and won thousands of people overseas to Christ. And, you know, you think about that, that, you know, in the eyes of the world, that one convert in five years didn't seem to amount to anything, small country church. But yet in, in the kingdom, that young man went to, went to, you know, overseas, went to some of the hardest to reach people groups and won them to Christ. So that pastor, though he felt like a failure, he was not a failure because that one, just that one man that he won to Christ was able to go and win many more. So don't think about, you know, oh man, I'm pastor. If, you know, we think of pastors and, um, you know, maybe you started a ministry and you think, well, I'm just not impacted very many people, you know, maybe something that you're doing and you think, you know, I, I started doing this for the Lord, thinking it was going to reach some people, thinking that people were going to, you know, really be impacted by it. And, and you hadn't seemed to have um, seen a whole lot of fruit from that. I want to encourage you that if God led you in that, just be faithful to do the work he's called you to because you just don't have any idea of what God may do in one of the children, one of the kids um, that, uh, you know, are there, you know, that they're a part of this. And so, um, yeah, just want to want to encourage you in that, that, uh, you know, that, you uh, you know, that's just important. That's an important thing that we don't get caught up in all that, but realize that just one person is worth uh, our effort, our prayers, our time. Just one person's worth it because we never know what kind of, what God may do. And even if they don't go on to be some great minister, you know what? They'll be in heaven with us forever, okay? And so it's well worth that. Uh, and if so be that he find it, really I say to you, he rejoices more of that sheep than the 99 which went not astray. Man, you know, God rejoices. You know, somebody's been out in sin. I think of the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son and the party that took place when he returned home to his father's house. You know, when God sees some of these folks and they've been so far out and so in darkness and then they're saved, you know, God just re God rejoices and we should rejoice as well when those folks come to faith in Christ. He says, even so, it is not the will of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. You know, God's desire is that all men be saved. You know, I believe that. That's why I'm not a five-point Calvinist. I have some things, and I believe in the sovereignty of God, and, and uh, you know, but I, don't, I, I believe God wants everybody to be saved, and I believe God gives everybody an opportunity to be saved. I don't believe God creates somebody just to send them to hell. I believe God you know, creates men and he works in men's lives and then he gives men the opportunity to either accept him or reject him. And um, and I believe God's desire, okay, is that we all come to faith in him. Now, obviously that comes down to a decision we make, but I want you to know something. No matter what you've done in life, God wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to give you life. And you may have family and friends that are far away from God right now. I know this, no matter what they've done, God wants to save them. So keep praying for them. Keep witnessing to them. Uh, keep uh, looking for opportunities to show the love of Christ to them. Uh, because, uh, guys, it's worth it to walk away from the 99 and go after that one in order to see them saved. And when they get saved, God rejoices. The angels in heaven rejoice. Uh, the people in heaven rejoice. Actually, it says in the presence of angels. But I believe the angels join in too. But we should rejoice as well. Guys, God bless you. Hope you have a good night. Stay warm. Stay safe. Uh, 
Maybe we're going to get some ice. I don't know. We'll see what happens. God already got some. Uh, pray that God, uh, you know, lets some of this go on. I would love to see some snow, um, but uh, wouldn't wouldn't uh, uh, whatever happens will. But uh, we trust the Lord. But I am praying for God not to let the ice get too bad. Keep folks' power on, and just pray for all those out on the roads and those working in this. Uh, God bless y'all. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow.